I'm Samantha Carey, a partner with Hydrogen Struggles and a member of the healthcare CEO and board practices and private equity practice. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Markovich and Mary O'Hara, respectively the CEO and CHRO and head of internal communications of Blue Shield of California, a $22 billion nonprofit health plan seeking to transform the healthcare industry, no small feat. A little bit about Paul, uh, president and CEO, has been with Blue Shield over 20 years in total. Uh, first joined the company in 1996 in a product management role. Left in 2000 to co-found a startup, rejoined the company in 2002, and took over as CEO in 2013. Mary O'Hara is a CHRO and SVP of Internal Communications, has led talent and development strategies for 28 years across 13 countries, joined Blue Shield from a highly successful career outside of healthcare. So starting out just a little bit on what's shaped you both, what has been the most pivotal experiences shaping your personal leadership journeys? For me, I, I grew up, was born and raised in North Dakota, and there's just a set of values that get instilled with you, with uh, with your parents there. Uh, authenticity and humility come into mind as two of them. I think those have stuck with me. But I, one other formative experience for me was when I was um, interviewing for a scholarship just after I graduated college, and I was being asked the question by the panel um, that the founder of this trust had wanted to give the scholarship to people who would fight the world's fight. And what's the world's fight to me? And at the time I was 22 years old, I do not remember what I answered. Uh, it clearly was a good enough answer because I ended up getting the scholarship, but it really stuck with me and it catalyzed something that had always been inside of me, which is that we all have an obligation to try to leave the world a better place than we found it. And, uh, and then it made me keep asking that question until, at least from a professional standpoint, I answered it because I feel like trying to create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable is the world's fight for me. Mary. Well, my personal leadership journey has really been through a course of um, certainly having tremendous parents that helped instill a set of values and a set of life experiences that shape that, but also it's marked by being a hanger arounder, for lack of a better way to describe it, in lots of instances in multiple sectors where I had a privilege to just watch and observe and develop from a leadership point of view, a learning posture by virtue of seeing how it's done well, and also seeing ways what there where it hasn't been done so well that helped solidify for me a point of view about what I stood for and a set of values in terms of what I want it to be known for and how important that was in the execution of my responsibilities to try to influence the thinking and the action of others. So my personal leadership journey has been a combination of where it came from, but certainly my opportunities to be a hanger around her as well. Paul, well, obviously, healthcare is the world's fight. All of us will touch the system at some point. What drew you both to healthcare? Well, I appreciated how it is important to everyone. At some point in our lives, we all need to use the system. So it's universal mm -hmm. and it's broken <laughs> and it's complex. So Solving it wasn't going to be a snap of the fingers, and uh, it really has multiple elements associated with it. There's the core business elements you would have in any business environment, but there's also social and political and, and emotional issues tied up in it. So it's an incredibly complex Gordian knot. So the ability to find it um, both worthwhile in terms of the outcome but highly challenging of me and requiring uh, me to continuously improve and build skills in order to help make a contribution to it. Those are the things, you know, making, being able to do good, make a difference while improving myself. For me, I undoubtedly became really, really clear at a certain juncture in my career that what I was doing insofar as the contributions that I can make needed to have more tight alignment to a purpose and values. And when I thought about the opportunity to join Blue Shield, I had an extraordinary example of a leader in Paul uh, 
who stood for something that was more than just the bottom line and an opportunity to do work of real meaning against a cause of great importance that I have personal experience for sure in my family and in my life that equally um, affected me. And I could see the purpose and the opportunity to take my talents and contribute to something of great meaning with somebody that was a real role model. Paul, when you think about who inspires you and who you benchmark against, who would that be and why? Anytime that I see leaders demonstrating the qualities that I think are so important to effective leadership, uh, integrity, authenticity, and humility, um, I find that uh, inspiring. And there are there are plenty of examples of it all the way around. I wouldn't say that I'd pattern myself around any one one particular leader, but I do find it inspiring when you see leaders standing up and looking to do the right thing, having a strong moral compass, and trying to do what's right for the organization as opposed to what might be right for them. And I have the exact opposite reaction when I see far too often the opposite, which is, you know, CEOs using the company assets as their own personal piggy bank or the employee base as their own personal dating pool or not confronting wrongdoing, but rather mm -hmm. putting it under the rug in order to try and keep the results going. Those are the kinds of things we've seen all too often. And I think they breed a skepticism and even a cynicism about our institutions and our leadership. Trying to do take on healthcare transformation is hugely heady and, as you mentioned, complex and risky. How does your personal mandate for transformation, not just a blue shield, but of the industry, change your leadership style? I do think you have to lead by example. And so far as what great leaders do, I think you have to take a stance that you're going to be a learner. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be willing to lead the way with humility and to say, I'm prepared to be a role model to others, including holding up a set of standards that I'm willing to be judged by myself. And if you're trying to transform anything, healthcare or anything, whatever that is, you're going to make some mistakes along the way. You're going to have to certainly be a learner and somebody that embraces what is it that I can take from this experience that I can improve upon and go at this with a different perspective the next try? So there's an extraordinary amount of resilience that that requires and a resourcefulness that goes along with that learning posture. Yeah, I, I quote Ralph Waldo Emerson all the time, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. And when I translate that into more modern language, people follow the CEO's feet, not the CEO's mouth. And so you have to just do what you expect of others. And so you constantly need to be challenging yourself. And, and I take that seriously. I take it to heart. I have a coach and I, I have him interview my direct reports twice a year and give feedback. And I have a development plan and I share it with the board and I share it with my team. I get a little tired of it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Me coming back saying, this is what I'm working on. But when you then show up and ask them to do the same thing, uh, it comes with a level of credibility. There's something really um, powerful in that surrendering to not leading from a position of power, ironically. Mm -hmm. This notion that uh, your leadership role is for this purpose, not in order to um, bestow power, you know, uh, and control others. You know, Mary and I often talk about creating commitment rather than compliance. If people are doing things because we're telling them to do things, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Especially when you think about trying to transform the healthcare system. It's not something anyone has done before. So you're looking for people to do some things that are innovative and new. They need to be inspired. You need great people doing their best work. You're not going to transform this system with mediocre talent any more than you're going to fly to Mars on a lawnmower engine. So people like that don't want to be told what to do. They want to know that their life and their meaning, their professional lives have some meaning, that they're making some contribution that matters and that they're able to grow personally, professionally, and financially. They want to work for someone that they can learn from and they can see uh, that's inspiring as an example. And so you have to strive for that as a leader, or I don't think you've got any hope to make this happen. 
You both have had great track record of success bringing in talent from outside the space. How do you then connect that talent to the folks who grew up in the space and transform that workforce into the next generation workforce you need going forward? If I just may tee up Mary for this, because pretty amazing how systematic she is about thinking uh, about leadership and growth and development plans and managing talent and thinking about succession and uh, from and and encouraging and managing growth in people across the spectrum at every level. So uh, there's lots that I could talk about, but pretty much it's Mary that has done it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I've just said, thank you. So I'll let Mary talk well, about that's, it. <laughs> I think I'm just going to ask for a raise. Now. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. But I will tell you what I told our board, by the way, on the second day on the job. Mm -hmm. So when I first met Paul and we decided we were going to do this thing, came to work on my first day. He said, by the way, tomorrow's our um, board meeting. And I'd really like you to just, you know, just a one pager, tell them what it is that we're going to do here around our people's strategy. And I thought, wow, that's a sort of not a small ask on the second day on the job. But <laughs> undoubtedly, the first thing that I said to them is um, a phrase I'm sure you've heard before around having a tone at the top. And what I mean by that is, you cannot hope to inspire an organization to gel and align and act a certain way and believe things unless you know that you are emitting a signal at all times at the top of the organization. And that signal sets a tone for what is permissible behavior. And Paul, as he just described his coach, his engagement with his team around that, his constant learning posture has to be credible, has to be authentic. And in doubt, you know, the team around him that he surrounds himself with has to be seen that way. So the first thing that we did together was to really institutionalize that this is not something for the masses and not for the leadership team. I tell you that we spent a lot of time deeply thinking about enunciating what those attributes would be. Paul describes them in a shorthand really quickly, being a learner and continuously doing that and building high-performing teams and getting to results. But it took us a lot of time to think deeply about the things that would matter to both engage people at the heart level as well as the head level and how we might create a system that would energize the folks in this organization. It is true that, um, you know, he spends a lot of time on this, but so does his entire leadership team. And part of that starts with making sure that people that come here to work at Blue Shield, they all have to have a resonance with this mission. And the good news is, by and large, everybody that was already here joined Blue Shield because they are mission driven to start with. The other thing we do is adopt a posture of show how before we measure the know how. In other words, what we try to do is to demonstrate through our actions, but also through the practices that we instill, programs that we instituted, like our lead to excellence and our manage to excellence programs, the tools and the practices for leaders to both understand philosophically what we're talking about, to get aligned with the guiding principles associated with those things, and then to show them with, you know, examples in a program how to do it well. And we sustain that with communities of people all through the year. And if I just might add to that, Sam, I mean, it's impressive how systematic this is. None of this is left to chance. Mm -hmm. And it's it's in the screening process when you're getting interviewed and potentially hired. It's in the assessment process in your performance and it's built into the performance review. It's in the development plan that you might have if you aspire to get promoted to another role. And it's, uh, it's throughout the uh, process while you're here. It's, it's quite well thought through and, and integrated. So when we bring people in from the outside, we realize wherever you come from, you're a human being and there's going to be some learning and growth that you need to do. What is it that we need to spend time with you on and how do we support you? Our goal isn't to try to change people's personalities. We are trying to tap into their hearts and their minds. And by the way, common sense, although it isn't common practice, does seem to resonate. Mm 
And we're not talking to people about things that are so complex in nature that it that folks go, I don't understand what you're talking about when you describe personal leadership requiring trust or relational aspects and your ability to be a learner. People go, okay, that actually makes sense and resonates for the most part. We've gotten so much feedback over the years from people about how simple these concepts are, but also how deeply they feel supported in helping to grow them. And more importantly, that they resonate. You made a huge amount of progress. Uh, Mm -hmm. Journey is far from over. What are the biggest challenges that you still face? Well, we haven't created a healthcare system that's <laughs> yeah. worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. So I put that one at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, I, I do think when it comes to the people side of things, um, I think there's a few things on my list. One is I would like our leadership to more clearly mirror the ethnic makeup of our, the population that we serve. And we need to make more progress on that. We've done, uh, I think, a great job making sure that there's no pay gap between men and women. There's no pay gap between minorities and non-minorities for the same work. Uh, and making this, I think, a, a great place to work no matter what your background. Uh, and we're well represented throughout our employees in many respects. But at the leadership level, I think we need more ethnic diversity I do think one of the CEO's jobs is to make sure that they have uh, a strong successor or success, potential successors in place. If you really want to have not just a legacy, but to create something that's sustainable, Uh, I'm not planning on leaving anytime soon, but uh, at, at the same time, you have to be thinking about that. It isn't free food in the cafeteria or bringing your dog to work that's truly going to engage your heart and get you to bring your best self towards a cause of such meaning and to work as hard at it to solve these problems. It's actually feeling like you have a great leader that you can work with that actually cares about your growth and development and helps connect you to opportunities and makes you better every single day. It's working with people and colleagues that create an employee experience that you think is better than any place else you could be because you're on a high performing team that is accountable, that's continuously learning, that is challenged to do great work and to solve really important problems. It's a set of leaders that you look up to in an organization steering a ship in a certain direction that you feel like you can trust that are authentic and that are doing good not just good work, but they're doing good. And it's also about a place that you feel like you have opportunity to come out the back end where you're better off personally, professionally, and financially. Those are the things that we're trying to really instill in the minds of people that work here and to deliver against. And it's hard when you're competing for the scarcity of talent in a place that is the highest cost of living in the country that has a lack of affordable housing and infrastructure issues and all these sorts of challenges and um, potentially organizations that they're thinking about because the glitz and the glam of free food in the cafeteria and bring your dog to work might be uh, more appealing than coming here and doing great work, but really hard work and potentially growing to be the best leader you could ever be by virtue of the support that we put around it and leaving with a sense of pride that you helped transform this dysfunctional healthcare system. You're obviously both incredibly accomplished. You've come a long way and you've set a tone at the top that's really meaningful. As you think back to the younger version of yourself, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, Relax a little bit would probably be (laughs) the one for me. Uh, You know, what I have been, I think, learning throughout in my continuous learning journey is, um, any overuse strength becomes a weakness. And so I bring a lot of passion and energy, uh, to my job. And I think we talked about growing up in North Dakota and having Mm -hmm. a sense of humility, this idea that, well, if I can do it, then everybody can do it. And, uh, Mary occasionally points out, well, not quite true. (laughs) You are actually pretty good at some things that other people aren't. And so I would find myself, um, getting frustrated when things that I thought were pretty easy, others were struggling with and this sense of, well, if I can do it, they ought to be able to do it. Um, 
and then having this uh, in intensity and energy of wanting to get things done quickly. And so you show up and you, you're showing frustration and annoyance, which is not at all inspiring. It's not inspiring commitment. It's just, it may get people to move a lot faster in the 24 hours within which they have that experience with you, but it's certainly not going to help them be better in the long run. So I think one of the things I have been um, uh, growing in the most is this idea of um, having these be teaching moments and remembering how important it is to me to be making connections with people. I mean, at the end of the day, you've, uh, you got to love other people. And if you want to help them through an improved healthcare system, I mean, that's got at the root of what is a driver. And that needs to show up even in the moments when it's frustrating and hard and difficult. And, uh, and that's something I've been working on for a while. I think getting better at, but boy, it didn't show up when I was a lot younger. It didn't show up at all. In fact, that my first time being a leader, I didn't really have anyone reporting to me or much of anyone. They gave me this job. I went from having four direct reports to 40 direct reports. And I was running around like this whirling dervish and getting everything done and very proud of myself. And then I got my first round of feedback and my boss thought I was great. My peers gave me pretty good scores and the people reporting to me scored me a four on team building, which would have been fine, except the scale was a hundred. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so I had right there, I had this, uh, oh, uh, you know, they just don't get me. They don't understand me. Maybe I just need a different team. And then when I stopped and reflected on it, I said, no, they're, I don't have a followership problem. I have a leadership problem and I probably need to fix it. And what they were really telling me was I just brought nothing but intensity and transactions and get the work done. And there wasn't this sense of human connection. There wasn't this feeling that I cared. And uh, if at the root of it, you're not expressing that to the people that are close to you, that uh, how can you expect them to express it to the people you're serving, your members? So I have to remember uh, uh, that that's what it's about. And I, that's what I were, that's what I would, the advice I give myself, my younger self, it's the advice I still give myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so much of that resonates for sure. For me, I would also say, um, I had a, an incredible mentor that I worked with for years who I admired so very much. And a woman, a senior leader who as a woman, um, you know, you don't often see, in the C-suite, at least as I was growing up in my career, role models that are uh, as achieving as some of the men that I've had the privilege to work with. And I admired her style so much. And there was just always this um, very elegant but very effective approach to getting things done amongst a lot of males. And I used to seek out advice from her a lot. And she used to say to me quite often, Mary, just be you. Just be the best version of you. You can't be inauthentic and be something that you're not. And in some places, um, you may not fit. And you also um, may be less of you. That's not an excuse to not moderate and, you know, approach situations with the right skill and the right posture and the right learning. And that's really important to increase your repertoire of influence skills. And you also shouldn't try to contort to be a pear if they're looking for a banana. And I would say, particularly as a woman, that was a really important and um genuine, authentic lesson for me. Just be you. It's a great jumping off point for one final question, which is if you had the one piece of non-obvious advice for the upcoming leader, what would it be? Wear sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that would be one. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, that, Famous saying that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm -hmm. um, well, I like to say, at least with Mary, that leadership eats, cult eats culture for lunch because mm -hmm. so many people run around talking about culture. 
-hmm. And Mm -hmm. what are we going to do about our culture or the culture is this, or how do you change culture? And it's like Mm -hmm. talking about the weather or the air. Mm -hmm. And it's this passive thing that you can't control when all it boils down to is behavior and leadership. And so what I'd say is if you're trying to create the quote unquote right kind of culture and you, we haven't talked about culture up until this point because we, it's really about what gets you hired, fired, and promoted. These are the behaviors that we're looking for. These are the things that we reinforce. And these are the things that we don't want to see. And if you keep reinforcing those things, you make them clear. This is what we expect of you as leaders and you hold leaders accountable to that model. Lo and behold, that becomes your quote unquote culture. <laughs> and so just, um, I think for, I see sometimes leaders getting caught up in these complex questions about culture and how to move culture. And they're frustrated about the culture. And it really boils down to, well, how are you leading Mm -hmm. effectively? Like if you're all worried about this culture being siloed, go call Jane up, take her out to lunch, talk to her about, you know, what you're going to do, invite yourself or her to one of your staff meetings, you know, create a bridge, right? Go lead. Go be the world you want to see. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's why I, I would say to everybody, just don't worry about culture. Just be, worry about being an effective leader and embracing um, those qualities that you see in highly effective leaders and expect that of the people around you and culture will take care of itself. Um, I also got this piece of advice when I was writing my thesis and I was looking for um, counsel from my advisor who said, oh, you know, you're kind of overthinking this, Mary, just wear sunscreen, wear sunscreen <laughs> and make it matter, mm-hmm. make it matter. And I genuinely believe that is true, too, from a career point of view. I wish I'd have understood that much earlier in my career, you know. Uh, thankfully, Paul had that sense when he was going in for his scholarship interview to fight the world's fight. For me, I guess it took me a while to realize just how much energy it gives you mm. and how extraordinary um, your talents can become when you feel like your purpose and your values aligned to the work and the environment that you're in and the people that you're with that are emblematic of those things, if you're going to bring your energy and God knows how much time we have on this planet to 50 hours a week or whatever hours a week it is that you're working, gosh, make it matter. And it's an extraordinary gift to you as much as it is to everybody else that you're working with. At the risk of, uh, trampling on a fantastic ending in Bruce's <laughs> ended there. Um, I'm, I'm going to go one over my quota on the, on the advice <laughs> side of things. Um, this is uh, probably obvious, but uncommon. And that is take care of yourself. If you can't organize your own life, then you're going to have a heck of a time organizing a company or a department. And I see so many people who are just like they're train wrecks in their lives. They're thinking they need to work 80 to hundred hours a week and not get much sleep and travel all over the place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and at, at the end of the day, um, the quality of your leadership comes down to the quality of your interactions with other people. Mary says this all the time and it's so true. And you can't be your best self if you are chronically sleep deprived and, not eating right, not managing your stress. Not uh, wearing sunscreen. You're not wearing sunscreen. <laughs> you just can't be your, your best self. And so uh, you got to take care of yourself. And and that, I think, effective leadership uh, starts with that. Paul and Mary, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And thanks for listening to the Hydrogen Struggles Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.